Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Grace uh, Choto. I'm an AHDB Knowledge Exchange Manager. Welcome to the AHDB webinar on Septa Plus Outdoor Salads Herbicide Trials Results. A few housekeeping points. You're all muted, uh, so we don't pick up any background noise. Uh, if you've got questions, please uh, don't hold them. Uh, type them in as we go. I'll show you how in the next slide. Uh, we're timing this webinar and will be done by 11.15 at the most. We're recording it as well, so we can make it available on our website. Uh, for basis and Rosso points, uh, you can put them in the chat or you can email Rachel, whom we're working with. I'll let you know her uh details in the next slides and if you're tweeting it's at ahdb hort so on questions you should have a band on the right of your screen uh you should be able to minimize or maximize that band because there's a little red arrow like here um, and on that band when you maximize it if you go down to the bottom there's a box which says questions so you can type your questions in and we can pick them out uh, at the end of each presentation. Um, for basis and also points, please email Rachel Morrison at rachel.morrison at ahdb.org.uk. So we are running a series of webinars on Septa Plus. So this is uh, the first of many that are coming. Uh, please, if you're not signed up to be receiving these things, you can sign up, let us know, um, and we'll make sure you're signed up. Uh, to receive like events alerts from us so you don't miss any of them. Um, but if you know, most of you will know about the Septa Plus program um, that are on this line, but if you aren't aware, then the AHDB uh, Septa Plus program is, is for fast tracking new products into the crop protection tool, toolkit. AHDB is investing 1.7 million over four years to assess efficacy and crop safety of conventional pesticides and bioprotectants against target pest, weeds and diseases. These targets for Septa Plus for the pest, weeds and diseases are agreed at crop association meetings, at grow meetings using live pest disease uh, or weed risk registers. So essentially we've got a risk rating matrix that we use. So let's say there's a new pest or an old pest that's now becoming a problem because we don't have seed treatment and it's rising, it's becoming a problem, then what we'll do is we'll move it up uh, the risk register and then it goes into um, uh, Septa Plus, uh, but this is at the agreement uh, of, from growers. So Septa Plus is led by a consortia across the crop production industry, including applied horticultural researchers and practical agronomists like David Norman, who's joining us today, uh, who's one of our speakers. So to date, we've, uh, and we actually, this numbers might, might be slightly more because these are slides, they're Joe Martin slides from uh, late last year, but so, but we're still working because this is an ongoing program. So 59 products have been tested in 71 trials uh, on 50 different crops. And from there, we've had uh, two on-label approvals and 19 EMUs. And at any one point, we've got a number of approval applications uh, going uh, into CRD. So it's live, it's wanted by growers, and uh, this is what we do. Just to point out that we've had uh, some emus obviously through this uh, HDB Septa Plus program. Uh, for example, they're Devrinol on herbs and spinach and Venza. So we've got quite a number of products there, pest disease and weed control products. And again, we've got uh, at any one point, like I said, we are submitting emus, uh, working with manufacturers. Manufacturers also are working with us, uh, looking for uh, label approval where possible. We are generating residue, residue data where it's needed so we can apply for these emus. And in those programs, because we're not only looking at conventional uh, and we were moving towards these biologicals, botanicals, biopesticides, bioprotectants, we're identifying quite a number of those, including, for example, in our Septa Plus uh, project uh, 07 uh, products for lettuce down in mildew's control. So moving on to our program, we'll start with David Norman of um, Oh, this is wrong. I don't know how it changed. Sorry, David. It shouldn't say um, ADAS, uh, but it's David Norman, Lettuce and Celery Trials and Results. 
Um, then we'll move on to Angela with spinach trials and grower demonstration plot findings. Each uh, presentation will be followed by five minutes of questions. So just to introduce our first speaker, whom you'll know if you're working in the leafy salad sector, I, if you don't know David, I don't know. I know David, <laughs> and I'm sure you do as well. But uh, David is um, an independent consultant agronomist with 35 years of practical experience in intensive commercial production of vegetable and salad crops. After graduating, he worked as a research, research agronomist with PGRO and then as a scientific officer in math. Following this, he spent 10 years as a consultant agronomist with ADAS before launching his own independent consultant business, Fresh Produce Consultancy Limited, in 1993. So since 1993, Fresh Produce Consultancy has provided a range of technical agronomy and precision services to vegetable and salad producers, mainly in East Anglia. And David sits on the AHDB Salads R&D Group and the AHDB Onion and Leek R&D Groups, his technical consultant, to British Leafy Salads Association. So over to you, David. Okay. Um, just checking that everybody can hear me. I should be in screen sharing mode by now. Let me just get we can see your slides. Yeah, and we can hear you properly. See my slides? Yes, and they are okay. in presentation modes. Thanks. Very good. Right, let me just move these things about. Anyway, uh, that's the tech working, it looks like. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Grace. Um, as Grace said, I'm going to be uh, just running through the work I've been involved with with the Scepter Plus projects for the last couple of years. Um, specifically, I'm going to be talking about some lettuce work that we did this year. This is uh, work that was done this, this autumn, so it's pretty fresh off the press. And also, I'm going to run through um, some salary work we did last year. Um, and for those that actually came on the, uh, the open day that we had last year, I've actually managed to decode a few products. So there's, there's something there to, uh, of interest, even, even if you came and saw the trial. And it would be great if we got onto the next slide now. Let me just have another little click. There we go. Um, so starting off, we're going to start off with the uh, with the lettuce work. Um, I'm going to talk about the background where we where we did it, treatments, results, and uh, the, uh, the the key messages and actions out of that work. So. Just a bit of background, obviously in lettuce, we've lost a few key actives. I mean, going back years, which I'm afraid I do now, um, I can remember when we were using Propaclor uh, was our main herbicide and the only thing we've ever managed to use that actually control groundsel properly. Um, and of course, uh, Chlorprofam, which has been used on lettuce uh, ever since I've been involved with lettuce uh, over 30 years. Um, which we lost in uh, in 2020. So, uh, well, last year was our last year of use. So we're becoming really reliant on um, a, a smaller amount of actives, particularly pendimethalin. The loss of in uh, chlorprofam last year, particularly difficult for growers on organic soils that have to deal with repeated weed flushes. And um, so this trial was really focusing on on replacements for that. So the uh, the site that we had for this lettuce trial um, this year was uh, was very kindly provided by G's Growers, Cam's Farms Growers. It was at Redmere Farm in Cambridgeshire. It was um, what you call an organic loam, uh, certainly not a PT site. It was more more mineral based with a with a reasonable amount of organic matter. So an organic soil is one between 10 and 20 percent organic matter peats over over 20 percent so it was certainly in the organic rather than PT classification um, that was planted uh, in early august 5th of august um, the variety was koala it was iceberg lettuce uh, it was watered straight after planting um, we had uh, three application timings so we had a pre-plant 
residuals which were applied literally uh, just in front of the planter um, a few hours before planting. The first post plant T2 was applied a week after planting on the 12th of August and uh, the T3 was applied 14 days after planting on the uh, 19th of August. So these are the treatments. Uh, I've managed to decode what I've been allowed to be decoding and um, mainly we were looking at ether fumicate um, as a replacement for potential partial replacement for chlorpropham. Um, so that was the main post planting treatment. Pre planting we had a new, well I say new, it's actually not a particularly new active but new to lettuce active 9918. And we had that in combination either with straight pendimethylin or wing P. Um, we also had ether fumicate pre and post. And um, with the post applications, we either looked at one or one and a half litres of FF ether fumicate. Um, so there are 12 treatments, three reps, uh, double untreated, um, lots with two metres by six metres. So this is the um, weed control in effect. So the table here actually shows you the percent weed reduction. Um, so the higher the uh, figure, the percent figure in the table, the better the weed control. Um, we actually had a really good effect from the, the herbicides, uh, as well as being irrigated, there was quite heavy rainfall on this site, so it was quite wet and the, um, the residuals worked pretty well. And it was also a pretty weedy site. So actually all the treatments gave a highly significant reduction in weeds. Um, the best treatment was this treatment 4, which had the uh, AHDB 9918 plus Stomp Aqua followed by two doses of ether fumicate at a litre, which gave us a 62% reduction in weeds. Um, but actually, uh, three, five, uh, six, and seven, um, and also nine to some extent also um, gave good weed control. Um, the poorest really was um, treatment eight, where we used ether fumicate as a, as a pre-plant residual, followed only by ether fumicate. So there was no other mode of action in there. So you might kind of, kind of expect that really. Um, ether fumicate on its own as a residual, um, probably not the right place for it. It's, it's better as a, as a post-emergence, post-planting treatment. So this is just the same data shown in, in graph form. Um, Again, this is in percent weed reduction. So the higher the, the graph, the better the reduction in weeds. So it's compared against the untreated there. It was a really weedy site. Um, I'll show you some pictures in a minute. Um, there's lots of fat hen, lots of red shank, some small nettle, common chickweed, and uh, a reasonable splattering of groundsel. In terms of crop damage, obviously, um, there's no pain, no gain with herbicides, so you always get some effect from herbicides. But actually, the, um, the crop damage levels were relatively low. Um, here, the higher the score, the more crop damage there is. Um, and I would have said up to sort of ones and twos is acceptable, probably three and more um, is getting a bit edgy. Um, so the only treatments where we saw what I wouldn't like to see i.e. unacceptable was where we used the ether fumicate at 1.5 litres um, which was treatment seven and nine and all the rest okay there was a little effect but not too bad and that's just the same data in graph form and again you can see um, and these are the crop damage assessment dates so uh, uh, five different dates so the only real issues were this uh, treatment seven and treatment nine, where we used the higher do dose of uh, ether fumicate. So just a few pictures. Um, this is the lettuce crop. So uh, on the left here, you've got the untreated, and this was uh, three weeks after planting. And you can see there's a, a good scattering of weeds there. And that was treatment four, which was our best treatment. Uh, again, um, 
three weeks after planting, which was the um, AHDB 9918 plus the were followed by Ethiopian uh, insect. So you can see the level of weed we had at the site. Um, this is the trial site. Uh, the bottom left was the untreated, and of course, all around the edges was untreated. And uh, if you look carefully, you can see plenty of red shank and uh, fat hen um, all around these untreated bits all around the trial. Um, and looking at the, the best of the treatments, treatment four, um, well, you can actually see some lettuce. So I think that's pretty good uh, compared with the untreated control, which was pretty much drowning in fat hen and red shank. Um, so uh, that, that I would have thought is a pretty good result. So just concluding the, um, the lettuce work. So, I mean, all, all of the treatments gave a significant reduction in, uh, in uh, scent uh, weed ground cover. Um, and probably the most effective was uh, the treatment four, which is HDB 9918 at 0.48 plus Aqua at uh, 1.5 and that was followed by uh, ether fumicate post planting and the porous weed control was uh, treatment eight which was the ether fumicate pre-planting followed by ether fumicate post planting so no other actors involved in that one and in terms of damage um, really it was only treatment seven and nine which were a cause for concern which were the higher rates of uh, ether fumicate when we went up to 1.5 litres, which is uh, patently a little bit too much. Um, treatment four and six and seven showed a little bit of damage, but as I said, the uh, I think the levels were, were, were probably acceptable um, and we managed to get a, a crop that was, uh, was harvestable after that. So, Take home message, obviously 9918 looks useful pre-planting, um, effect uh, ether fumicate, um, not great pre but good post and uh, HDB are generating data. Um, this year we have uh, money in the budget to generate data for ether fumicate to take that forward but obviously that's going to be a couple of years um, before we get there and uh, we're going to look at the uh, data requirements for 9918 to see uh, how far we can take that and how quickly. So moving on from um, lettuce to celery. Um, now, as I said, the, the celery work was, uh, was undertaken in 2019, so the previous year. And uh, I know several of you will have uh, visited the site because we had an open day, but I have actually managed to uh, to decode a few of the treatments, so there's there's uh, there's there's some interest here, and uh, so I'll just quickly whip through that. Um, yeah, that's just introducing the thing. So the the celery work again was uh, was undertaken at uh, G Shropshire and Sons at their Norfolk farms. This was at uh, Pioneer and Severals Farms, Methwold Hythe in Norfolk, and now. For those that you know that area, it's a really peaty soil type. It's a proper deep peat, sort of 60% organic matter. Um, grows weeds like there's no tomorrow. So uh, again, a good weedy site. For that one, we, it was a midsummer planting, um, planting early July, 2nd of July. Uh, the variety was Victoria. Um, we split this trial into two. So essentially it was two trials side by side because we wanted to tease out the differences between the pre-plant and the post-plant treatments. Whereas in the lettuce, we'd actually done some work in 2018 with single treatment. So I was looking more at sequences, but this um, was really to try and tease out the differences with the pre and the post-plant. Um, so that, that's why we separated out the uh, into two trials. Um, so this was the, uh, the pre-planting treatments. We had uh, diflufenican, um, Flexidor, uh, a numbered one again, 9918, which was actually the same one that we saw in the lettuce, and um, pendomethylin and clomazone, which was the um, field standard, really. Um, as I explained earlier, this site was really peaty site and it was on the edge of a field, really weedy. I mean, those of you that came to the site will see it's a, it, it's a wonder you can grow any 
crop there at all, the amount of weeds, and, and none of those pre-planting treatments had a significant effect on weeds. So you can see it, at each assessment, these um, boxes are blue, which means there's no significant effect over the herbicide. It just shows you what, uh, what we're up against there, really. Um, and at 60% plus uh, organic matter, the residuals really aren't doing very much. So this is just a, a, a view of the trial site. Um, as you can see, that on the left-hand side was the pre-planting um, trial. And as you can see, it's just completely covered. This was within about four weeks of planting. It was completely covered with weeds. You couldn't see a thing. And the post-planting one was on the right, where we did actually have some, some nice differences. So in terms of the post-planting treatments, um, the ones that gave, this is uh, weed cover and um, percent weed cover. So the higher the figure, the more the weed. So apologies for the slightly different way of presenting the figures. But what you can see is the boxes that are sandy colored were significant in terms of reducing weed. So we had uh, clonophen uh, either at half liter or 0.75. And this of course we did before we had the uh, um, emergency, the uh, emu that came through which actually gave us 0.65, which was somewhere between the two. Um, the AHDB 9918 actually gave a reasonable effect at the, uh, at the higher rate, but not much at the lower. The Flexidor um, is really a residual and it's pretty weak on organic soils, so that didn't do much. Uh, 9864 was good and uh, ether fumisate we had at 0.75, not enough at a litre, it, it did some good. The Medifam Betsana we had um, relatively weak on its own, either at a litre or at two litres, um, but I think mixed with other things it could be useful. We had Hurricane Diflufenican, which gave good weed control, and the commercial standard really, Stomp Aqua plus Defy at full dose, which gave good weed control. And as I said, it was a pretty good weedy site. This is just that data uh, in, in graph matter. This is percent weed reduction. So the higher the bar, the better the weed control. And that's the stomp aqua defy. And um, that's the uh, hurricane. In terms of crop damage, there was a little crop damage showing early on in the first two assessments. And that was uh, a clone of an emerger. And those that of you used it commercially will be aware of those symptoms. And uh, Hurricane produces a, a fairly similar symptom. Um, but actually, all that grew out. And by the time, uh, and certainly by three or four weeks after treatment, uh, there was no sign of any problems. So just a few pictures of that trial. Um, untreated on the left, uh, that was Emerger at half a litre. And that's two weeks after treatments, 15 days. So good effect. Um, those of you that have been using a merger on celery will know that it makes the leaves go spotty, but that's only the treated leaves. And uh, within a few weeks, that's grown out and looks okay. Um, that's a merger on the left with uh, AHDB 9864 on the right, which was very good and also controlled ground soil as well as pretty much everything else. So in conclusion, um, HDB 9864 um, was very useful and also controls ground salt. The, the issue with this active, it's been nominated as an endocrine disruptor by EU. So we will awaiting that outcome. We're yet to know really whether the UK is going to diverge on that, but I suspect if it, that one isn't approved through the EU, then the market might be too small. A clonophone emerger, actually gained an approval on celery uh, for 2020. Those of you growing will know at 0.65 with a 60 day harvest interval. So that was really useful. Ether fumisate looks useful. Um, we need to look at the route to approval for that because I suspect we'll need um, metabolism data. And diflufenican also looks very useful. 9918, um, the residually type one, again, looks useful, but um, we need to do further work on route to approval. Then Medifem, I think, is quite limited. Um, could be useful in mixtures. 
and uh, Flexidor isoboxen, um, pretty useless on these uh, really peaty soils, although <laughs> it may become approved for celery. So that was all I want to go through today. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to say many thanks to Cheese Growers, Shropshire family, uh, for providing the sites. That's at Cam's Farms and Norfolk Farms. And I'd like to thank uh, Bellette, who's now uh, enjoying herself in uh, Copenhagen, no doubt, and uh, Angela and Joe for helping uh, sort out the treatments and uh, sorting out the samples. Thank you very much. Uh, back over to you, Grace. Thank you, David. Um, I've got no questions at the moment. If you've got any questions, please type them in right now. I'm just going to ask you a question, David. Obviously, now with Brexit, we are totally out. <laughs> we are out, out. It's, uh, you know, uh, that ended in the new year. Um, but what are your thoughts as regards uh, CRD and processing emus and these things uh, that, uh, you know, all these, because in the past we've had complaints and we are not too happy they are slow we want emus fast all these other things do you think that's going to get a lot better uh when they are operating on their own as it were um obviously they are still pulling through emus and uh, getting approvals uh we've got that agree agreement in place but in terms of just getting emus through quickly do you think we're going to improve what are your thoughts well i can't really see the, um, the the pace of approval being better essentially what happened on the 1st of january we took the whole of the eu legislation into uh, the uk and called it our own so the mrls which were eu mrls became uk mrls and and all the legislation that previously was eu legislation just was taken into uk law so at the moment uh, we're following all the rules of the eu and, but there will be divergence as we make our own decisions. The EMU process won't really be any different because each country actually uh, manages their own minor uses. So all every country has its own minor uses and uh, the process for doing that, I don't think is going to change very much. Uh, and I also suspect that uh, CRD HSE is going to have a lot more work on its hands because obviously they've got to process main approvals because they will be giving approvals from the 1st of January. There's no new approvals for the EU. All new approvals will go through the UK. So actually they're going to have a lot more work on their hands. Uh, I just hope they're prepared for it. Mm, all right. If you've got any questions, uh, even later, because uh, we are going to move on now to our next uh, presenter, please type them in because David will still be there and will come at the end and uh, he can answer questions directed to him. All right, uh, we need to move on now to Angela. So our next speaker, I hope you can see my screen. Yeah. So our next speaker is Angela Hackel uh, of Ada's Horticulture. So Angela is the vegetables research consultant at, uh, consultant at ADAS, working on weed control, crop nutrition and agronomy. Angela delivers AHDB funded Septa Plus herbicide trials work on vegetable crops, including trials on leafy salads. She's basis and facts qualified with over 10 years experience on a range of vegetable crops. OK, handing over to you, Angela. So, right, just uh, my presentation up. It's up now, you just need to put it in slideshow. Excellent. So, is that now in slideshow? Yes, it is. Thanks, Ange. On the main slides, I guess. Yep. Excellent. So, uh, thank you very much, Grace, for the introduction there. Um, so you've seen David has spoken about the lettuce and celery work that was carried out as part of Set to Plus, and um, I'm now going to move and talk about something which has been three years working in Set to Plus because of the uh, loss of authorizations, which is as the work was carried out on small plot trials to start with, and then last year we the growers actually hosted their own trials to gain more information on the more promising products. 
So I, I'm sure the spinach growers on, on this webinar are very much aware of the changes and, and losses and challenges that have been, happened over the last two years with uh, the loss of the key crop safe pre-merged herbicides for spinach. Um, so when SEPTA Plus was looking for targets of crops to in salads, um, it, it came up in 2018 that Venzar was going to be lost, lose its pre-emergence authorization sort of early in 2019. So we then made it sort of a priority crop for the next three years of work through SEPT Plus just to look for alternatives because the urgently re replacements required. So not only, but as part of SEPT Plus, we did actually manage to secure that post-emergence use for Venzar. So although it's less effective in that use because its action is mainly res residual, and, in, and once it weeds are emerged, it's also less effective on composite and polygonum weeds, particularly a post in time. It, it did give some reduction, I think, um, in speaking with growers about its use. But unfortunately, then there was another blow with uh, the loss of chloridazone and chlorprofam gone. So the work was sort of, this is why we've done a lot of work over the last three years on these particular, on, particularly on spinach. So, so if we go back to 2018, um, this was the first herbicide side screen we started, and I'm just going to recap the last couple of years just to go through the, the products that were screened out. So this was the first trial we did, which was had 14 experimental treatments with seven products at different rates. The target of this trial was to screen out the potential candidates to take forward and discard those to the side or the rates to the side of some of them which hadn't got any crop safety. So you'll see in that top right picture, that was the trial in Wiltshire. And you'll see there's some crop losses there. So those particular ones weren't taken forward. So you've got those on the right. And in that table, you can see that the ones not in italics were the pre-emergence treatments, the ones in italics are the post-emergence treatments. So as you can see there, we had Venzar at 0.4 litres hectare in that trial post-emergence, just to look at efficacy and crop safety in that one as it was going getting the authorization that year. But there was a number there of treatments to take forward which we took forward into 2019 to further sort of refine, take forward those promising products and then refine down rates on those considered sort of marginal on crop safety. So this was carried out in West Sussex um, with assistance from Liz Johnson, which I'm very grateful for her assistance in assessing this trial. So there was a pre separate pre and post emergence trials this time, the screen them differently and look at the different sort of separate them out and look at the different act, modes of action and pre and post as to what was best placed where. So at each one we had 10 experimental treatments per trial plus an untreated in the standard and two to three rates of each product. So you'll see there there was six pre-emergence and five post-emergence. And as I said before, because we were seeing that there was limited options coming sort of forward, we also looked at authorized products previously considered too marginal marginal on crop safety to use, such as the better sign or C, which is fed Medifam and things like dual gold. Um, one thing I did say about the previous 2018 trial was that was actually a reasonably safe year for that. So whereas in this year, we actually saw more crop effects due to the, um, the weather at the timing of application. So just prior to drilling this trial, there was actually heavy rainfall and also 24 hours after the crop was drilled and the herbicide application for the pre-emergence treatments. And then just to uh, add to that, that was uh, the post-em trial, the, the growth stage came just about right and that hot window of weather. So I think that was at the end of July or August. So that was, um, although the application was made, the post-em application was made at 19 to 24 degrees C, subsequently on the August bank holiday weekend, um, it then switched to sort of 29 degrees C in that hot bank holiday. So what we saw was you didn't see any effects at all from the dual gold in the 2018 trials. It did actually give spotting on in this trial. And we also saw spotting of variable crops down from the ethyfumosate in the 2019 trials. And then for 2020, um, the aim of this trial was actually to shortlist the products from the previous trials so that growers could take them out onto their own sites. Um, part of the reason for looking at this, which I'll come on to the next slide a little, is because um, growers had experienced Devonol, as you saw in Grace's slides, was authorised as part of the Septa Plus programme. 
but we've only sort of seen that in limited situations. Um, and extremes of the season, extremes of weather, it subsequently turned out that there was crop losses with the use of the product. So therefore, what we wanted to look at was um, a wider range of situations in grower led trials. So for these trials, they're sort of limited slots because of the um, because of the time sort of to sort of get for the growers to be able to get them on. So it's not so much the applying it, it's the washing out and changing in between. So there's, you know, within fitting that in their own sort of commercial operations and carrying out this trial, which I'm very grateful for, we want to sort of go down to the, the select the uh, products which were sort of most effective, but also consider the likelihood of authorization to look at things that were going to come out in the next two to three years. So that's how we sort of shortlisted that down. So with pre-emergence time in the biggest gap with the loss of, say, for chlorodazon and um, lettuce cells, Venzar, we sort of focused a lot on that. So what we did was had a, a, a focus group with the BLSA um, and where we discussed the products to take forwards. Also had on that Bless and Joe to look at the authorization side. So. We went back to 9918, which was safe as a pre-emergence in 2018, that's looking useful to bring forwards. And then also said, we don't like we've done before, looked at the 29 products and the margin of safety, but revisited those at lower rates. So therefore we've took effect, which is Ethophemus 8 down to half a litre per hectare, and the 9878 sort of really took that down to sort of 0 0.15 litres hectare and 9987 at quarter rate. As well as these, there was two other new products which became available. So we decided to include those to see how they performed as well. And at some sites, not all the sites used um, Medifam, it was up to the growers which ones they could uh, choose. So therefore we, we also included that where people wanted to understand crop safety in different application conditions, then they could use these trials to include Medifam. So as I said previously in the slide before, um, we, the rationale for this change of approach was due to that it's situations we'd seen with the uh, the proper mide and gaining some understanding of using herbicides in a wider range of conditions. So while single replicated trials are good for screening out promising products, we only see the herbicide and crop response in a snapshot of a situation, perhaps on one or two soil types at one point in the season. I mean, so although they provide a good baseline and guidance to work from and look for the of promising products to authorise or start to authorise, they don't give information on crop and herbicide response at extremes of the season or a wider range of soil types. Therefore, that's why we took this approach to, as I said before, um, do a large number of smaller growers managed trials to increase the range of situations of understanding and therefore get a greater information to use. And so that this would hopefully can guide some understanding for use and minimise the risk of crop damage. So the photo I've got there, this is um, one of the products in the trial, and that's kind of that was sort of an extreme end of crop damage we were seeing um, with one of the products, and that's one of the ones we won't take forward. So just a little bit about the the uh, grower managed trial design. So we had eleven grower hosts and uh, who took part, and uh, who sent me fourteen trial results. So. And I'm thankful for this because this required a great deal of cooperation in kind from the growers. Um, but given the situation with the loss of herbicides, they were quite keen to be involved and and trial these herbicides themselves. Um, I know there is still some coding on here, so the growers are involved, and it did sign a a um, confidentiality agreement to take part. So they were sort of yeah could use the products confidentially. So what we, we I did, I uh, put together a protocol of assessments so that all the sites would be assessed consistently for crop safety and efficacy in a similar way, um, giving sort of a, a guide on descriptions and photos for the growers to follow. So therefore all the results could be comparable. And so well, this, what we did with this was took the promising products and previous work into a commercial situation. So we had nine treatments, including an untreated control. So we asked everyone to include an untreated control and also replicate treatments twice. Um, so we had a set of comparisons. We chose four core products as a group. 
um, and then the growers could choose to do four more if they had capacity to do so. So probably about sort of 60% of the growers did the core products, uh, actually did all the products, and then a few didn't do some of the extra ones because of space and time, obviously with the, the crops and fitting it into their own commercial work. So if the products actually were mainly applied by tractor mounted or self-propelled sprayers, so really given a good commercial application. Um, there were two or three growers, growers or agronomists who had precision knapsacks and used those as well, but the majority were applied by tractor mounted and self-propelled sprayers and the trials were set out down a bed, as you can see there, in a randomised way. So if I move on now to the first look at crop safety, um, this is a quick overview of the mean crop damage for treatment. So the crops were scored from 0 to 5, with 0 being no effect on the crop at all, and 5 being crop death. Uh, 1 was seen as um, an acceptable level of crop damage to the grower. So there'd be a slight effect from the herbicide, but it wouldn't be anything it would be the crop would perhaps be rejected for. Now, while looking at mean crop damage, is, is sort of good to get an overview across the sites. It doesn't pick out the extremes. So what we we'll see here is this HDB 9952 at one litre hectare. Um, this comes up sort of two, which is sort of a severe, a slight to moderate effect on the crop as mean across all the sites. But what it didn't pick out was that some of the sites, there's a very extreme damage to the crop, as you can see here with extended cotyledons and very distorted leaves which persisted to the end of the end of the crop um, cycle to harvest. And these are scored at crop score four. So what I've done instead to sort of show this, and I'll spend a little bit of time on this, is um, separated out the percentage of sites at each score for the pre-emergence treatments. So I've taken out Femmedifam at this point and one of the rates of 9952, because that wasn't tested at all the sites. So what we're seeing here is the, is the um, six treatments which were tested at every site. And that's what you've got. The graph on the left is the crop damage at two true leaves, and the graph on the right is the crop damage at four true leaves. So look at the progression through the, the crop growth. Um, so as I saw before, you can see from the graphs, it indicates that HD9952, which is this one, I think is really not safe you know, to take forwards. It's, there were severe or moderate crop effects, even at four true leaves, in there up to about 50% of the crop. So the orange bar and the red bar. So what I've done with the color coding is the uh, zero where there's no crop effect is marked in green. The um, blue is slight but acceptable crop effect. And then sort of the yellow, orange and reds are sort of not acceptable. HDB9878 also had 15% of crops with the highest severity crop score. And I think that's one also probably not, not to pursue and it's just a bit too risky. But on a positive note, if we look at 9918 here on the left, this caused very little damage. And when it did, it was sort of not above an acceptable level. So this is a promising one to take forward. So it would be safe to use a pre -em in spinach. And also 9898, which is this one, while it caused some slight to moderate effects of which are leathery brittle leaves, and I've got some photos of those to show later and check the crop back. By four true leaves, you can see, apart from probably a couple of sites, the crop are grown through the, the effects. And effects, which is this one here, also caused slight to moderate damage in sites and all but one site. But again, the crop recovered on the whole from the herbicide effects, indicating it could be a useful candidate. And if we go to the final one, which is 9987, uh, this did cause greater effects on the crops than the products on the left of the graph. So you can see here, there's a severe effect at one site from this one. But by four true leaves, the crop was similar in appearance to the pl crop plots treated with effects, so it could have potential to take forward. It was also 9987, the most effective at weed control, um, in a number of providing good weed reduction and a scores a number across the greatest number of sites. So what we could look back here is um, it, what factors increase these risks to crop damage. So this is where I also, when I asked for the assess crop assessments, asked for information from the growers on soil types and application conditions and, and weather throughout the trials. 
just so we could try and get a handle on some of those which are marginal on safety when this when the um, crop damage occurred. So we've had four herbicides which are safe in the majority of the trials, so say 75% of the crops here scored but not on one. Um, so you've got 9918 and 9898, which were the most safe, the safest, and then we've got these in italics, which reflect on 9987, which you saw from the previous graph, did give some slight moderate to sort of, and in case of severe damage in 9987. So looking at the soil types in the trials, they range from sandy loam to clay loam, but the majority of crops were on sandy loam soils, which is not unexpected for spinach crops. On the, so then I looked at the treatments where there was no damage from any of the treatments at three sites. These are all on light sandy soils and across sort of, you know, the from June to August, so the summer to sort of early, late, early autumn part of the season. So there's not really anything to pick out why they wouldn't have, but the growers or agronomists who assess those crops did comment that the growing conditions for those crops were good with no extreme conditions. So then I looked to the moderate to severe, where the moderate to severe damage occurred, and this was at three sites. These are all sandy loam sites, so similar sort of soil type. Um, but what happened in these sites was the weather was either very hot or very wet around the application timing. Um, so at one particular site, this was carried out in the hot and dry late July, early August period, and it appeared that the um, herbicides exacerbated um, the stress on the crop that was already there. And then there was a, another site where it was hot and dry to start the trial, but then there was a heavy rain at the end. So there was circa sort of 160 mils at the end of that trial. So from looking at what I was given across sort of in the conditions, the crop damage seemed to be increased in extremes of weather, and that could either be dry or wet, so increasing crop stress. And also there was a bit more at the end of the season where prolonged wet, wet conditions were likely to occur. Um, soil type, I think looking at the, this is more looking at the crops in between, so the ones where there wasn't sort of none or severe, but where you look, um, looked at the crops um, where weather sort of was big, I say there was sort of less damage, there was sort of less damage caused by those in the margins of safety, such an effect on sort of a heavier soil type. So the weather is the, probably the biggest influence, but where you've got a lighter soil type and the weather, then those ones that are on the margins of safety are more likely to cause an issue. So looking at um, a little bit of weed control, so not all of the sites had weed occurrence in the trials or, or not all of the sites had enough across the reps, but there was enough instance in eight out of 14 trials where I could let reasonably assess an effect from the weed control um, from the herbicides. So what I've done is highlight in bold the safest herbicides um, and what you'll see is that 9987, so which is the one which is probably the most end of marginal control, gave the greatest weed control. So that was out of six out of the eight, eight sites, uh, which is 75% of them, that one actually gave reasonable effective amount of weed control and then you've 9918 9898 in effect it 50 percent of cases did actually reduce the weed though because we're looking at one particular sort of product or active it's not going to control probably all the weeds so they're going to let some through therefore these are probably products that we either want to be used in sequence or in combination in reality um, and then i've put the, the ones that were too damaging at the bottom I suppose they actually didn't give the best we control it in, in the greatest range of situations, so no problem. So I'm going to move now on to photos of the more four promising herbicides. So this is 9918. It's a residual herbicide, and you've seen David talk about this in the lettuce and celery trials as well. So that's the sort of range of weeds it controls there. It's, it's not got a huge range, but where those are present, it's effective. It does require, as with all a lot of residuals, moisture to work well didn't cause any very little crop effect and so all crops were deemed commercially acceptable by the uh, growers to assess them and this is a picture of a crop treated with it in a typical appearance. Moving to 9898, um, this again is a bit more of a limited weed spectrum um, but a different weed spectrum, so annual madagrass, amaranth, fat hen, 
Black Nightshade, South Isn't Shepherd's Purse. This here, if you can see, is the effect of the leathery leaves, which occurs about two true leaves. Didn't occur in all cases, but it did occur probably more likely where you, you had had those weather conditions where it's taken up a bit more. Um, but most at most sites, the crop grew through this distortion. But one thing to note is it tends to check the crop a bit behind. So sort of regards to scheduling, that would be something to take into account if you're using it. Um, that effect, so this actually caused more crop damage than the previous two. So you'll see in the photo here to the right, this is where I spoke about the where the crop, where the herbicide exacerbated the leaf effect, seeding the untreated in the hot, dry, stressed crop. So it just made it a bit look at, tougher looking. So this was scored as a three. Um, and then, but in some crops here, this crop's gonna look perfectly acceptable. And this one here scored just under a one with a comment of sort of variable growth stages and slight growth check. So it can have more effects on the crop, but it, it, it does have probably a greater range of weed control than the previous two. So I think as, as uh, David highlighted, I think it, it's there's no pain, no gain. I think that's probably the ones which seem to give the better weed control or greater range of weed control do have a greater effect on the crop. So this is 9987. Uh, one of the comments with this one is it a thinner stand, and I think you can see that in the larger photo here. Um, and also a flatter appearance of the crop, which is shown in the picture there, in the, the smaller picture. So if I move to the sort of sum up what we've found from this year, um, so there, there are four herbicides, I think, which can improve weed control in spillage and HDB are working towards authorization of these. Although to be honest, there's going to be a delay of at least a year or probably more to current authorizations, especially as um, authorized residue data is currently being generated for effect. That's the closest on the route to authorization. Um, HDB 9918, this is actually awaiting renewal um, and we'll need to generate data once it's renewed. So that once that's renewed, then HDB will pursue the, um, to get that one through the system. So I think that one does actually look the safest for all situations. Um, and then you've got 9987 and 9898. So these aren't actually authorized in the UK yet. So we're hoping for submission for these this year. And then once they're submitted, then residue data will be needed. So again, there'll be some delay to that coming on into sort of authorization, but we're sort of progressing that through as they come through. I think there was potential still with the treatments we had for, for slight to moderate crop damage from all of them, so except 9918, that's the one that's probably the safest, um, but you could mitigate against these by considering application for use. You might not want to use some of the ones, although they give the better weed control, if you've got extremes of the season or extremes of weather forecast, they consider whether or not to use, actually you want to use those ones. And also the soil type you've got. Um, just a note on post-emergence, Fenmedifam is currently authorized for spinach, but not baby leaves. I'm sure the agronomists are fully aware, um, and, but timing of application and weather conditions is key with this. So it needs to be applied at cotyledon and any later, and there'll definitely be a scorch on the potential of scorch on the crop or potential for crop loss and the leaves need to be waxed up when it's applied. So at those situations. Um, the one that's being pursued for baby leaf is Betasana SC, um, but then this is awaiting renewal and submission by UPL. So they will be progressed after that. Um, so I think it's just finally to sort of thank HDB for funding and keeping going through these trials. The input from all the agronomists who've advised me through the trials as well as the many big thanks to the many grower participants there are listed who carried out the trials and also sort of fed through the data to me which was really useful um, and I hope that's um, been a useful snapshot of what I've pulled together from the, the data that you've sent me. Um, so I just uh, move over to questions and hand back to Grace. Thank you Angela. Um... So we should, okay, you should be able to see my screen. I can't see you, Angela. I'm coming. There you go. Taking a while. 
Thank you. Um, I was just going to say, obviously, with uh, changing climates and extremes, which is becoming an issue now, do you think we should carry on with these um, kind of grower led uh, demo plots uh, rather than just you working with a host grower uh, like uh, we've done mostly in the past? What were kind of uh, your views uh, and just going forward? Um, I think for this situation, it worked really well. Um, there, where we've got, I think, products that are close and are, have got promise to come through, I think this kind of trial is really useful to gain that information across a wide range of situations to avoid you know, the, the, the mishaps with with using herbicides, especially for when they come out new. Um, there's probably still a space, place for screening out early, early sort of herbicide types, but to be honest, there's not that many coming through, so there probably is more of a role to learn about the ones that are coming through off emus. I see. It's really good, actually, that you've got those for spinach, those three, uh, promising um, ones, because it's still encouraging. I know it does take a lot, a lot of time, which is why, you know, going back to the day, uh, question I asked David, you know, how long will we get these things through? But certainly it does show the value of that Sector Plus program. David, a question came for you uh, in the meantime, um, and this is... With the lettuce herbicide trials, were there any differences with crop maturity dates? Do you think that there will be any differences in damage levels with different lettuce types? So were, was there any differences with crop maturity dates? And do you think there will be differences also in damage levels with the different lettuce types? I think you're muted, David. You're muted. We can't hear you, David. I turned my camera on, but not my microphone. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, we can. Thanks. Um, there would almost certainly be differences with different lettuce types. Um, we particularly did this trial on iceberg. Um, I would think had we done it on gem, uh, remain or some specialities, there would have been a slightly different reaction. But what you normally get with the more speciality types of lettuce is you get a, um, they're a bit more reactive. So usually it's a case of amending dose rates um, for varieties you know are a bit, are a bit sensitive. Um, work we did in 2018, we did on remain, um, so this time we decided to, to look at iceberg. Um, but yes, that there the will definitely be differences. Thank you, David. I just uh, forgot to point out uh, actually to our delegates, if you scroll, you know, on your band, uh, if you maximize it and just scroll down to where it says handouts, we've got uh, the presentations from uh, this event in a handout. So those slides are available. The recording obviously will be made available on the website, but if you want, you know, particularly Angela slides, the visual effects, you can see the photo on, on, on the crop if you need to. So you just scroll down to say it says, where it says handouts, and under those handouts, you click it and you can download it, and then you can save it. Um, so we don't have any more questions for you, Angela. I'm just going to move over. I don't know whether you can all see my slides at the moment, just to do the final wrap up slide. Can you see my slides, Ange, David? Yep. We can now, yeah, it's just changed. All right, thank you. So I'm gonna click myself off as well because I can't see, it covers most of my, my things. Fantastic. Just Angela now on top of my wrap up slides. <laughs> thank you, Ange. So just to wrap up, um, you know, thank you really, David. Um, in the handout, your details are corrected for your company. I borrowed that slide from someone. So yeah, hands off. Uh, it's not me, uh, but it's my fault. I should have looked through your company. But certainly you've got the corrected slides. What's important with the technical detail 
in the presentations, please download them and also point others to the recording which will be made available on our website. If you need basis and Russell points, please email Rachel who's in the background helping us with this. Thank you, Rachel, for your help. Um, uh, and uh, her details are rachel.morrison at hdb.org.uk. If you've got any further questions uh, if, uh, about this event, or any other questions, you know, you know where to get me. Those are my details. Grace.chota at ahdb.org.uk. Uh, and as I said, look out for future AHDB horticulture webinars, including a number of SEPTI plus ones and a lot more. As you know, obviously we are in the lockdown and we're delivering a lot of events digitally. So make sure you're getting your alerts from us. And if not, get in touch. So I'm going to end this now. We are in time. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, David. Thank you, Ange. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, goodbye. Good afternoon. Thank you, Grace. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.